Welcome to Current Affairs on JTV. Earlier, I caught up with Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, a former British chief rabbi, who's recently brought out a new book, Not in God's Name, Confronting Religious Violence. Rabbi Sachs, thank you for joining me uh, today. Um, can I start with a very simple question? Mm. Um, what is the central animating idea um, in the book, the one that if you only had one minute, as in this interview, to impart to the reader, you would seek to impress upon them? <coughs> If you want to understand religiously motivated violence, then you have to understand the religion, not just the violence. So um, you have to go back to theology. You have to go back to sacred texts. You have to go back to sacred texts which interpreted literally and applied directly lead to violence. And it then turns out that um, probably all the world's great religions have potentially violent texts within their literatures. And therefore, we are going to have to look at this again. It is the one thing that nobody expected in the 21st century. We've been through four centuries of secularization in the West, and people assumed that everyone who is going to become modern is going to become modern the Western way by secularizing. What's happening in the Middle East is therefore completely unexpected. Um, it's taken us continuously by surprise. Despite all the think tanks and the future-oriented institutes, virtually no one saw 9-11 coming. And out of nowhere, ISIS has emerged as a global force uh, perpetrating acts of violence in, in multiple continents within the space of weeks. And it seems to me that we've been continuously caught by surprise in the West because we never thought through what is religiously motivated violence. We haven't seen it in centuries. There's a, there's a lot in, in uh, what you've said that we can unpack. Um, if we start with this sort of concept of the group and religion, I mean, you mentioned that uh, religion has been a helpful <coughs> way of binding groups together, and that four centuries, if you like, of secularization has been an attempt um, in the West, perhaps sometimes, to, to bring those groups apart again, or at least replace the ideas with something else. And yet, we have failed. And I will quote you a piece you've written, which is, um, you say, try as the West may, the tribes keep coming back angrier each time. What are we doing wrong? Well, what we are doing wrong is assuming that you can have human beings without identities. That was the great fantasy of the West in the 18th century. Don't forget, in the 16th and 17th centuries, you had Protestants and Catholics murdering each other throughout Europe, beginning in France, extending to Germany. Major upheavals everywhere. So the 18th century said, let's get beyond Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Christian. Let's just deal with things that are universal, science and reason. And that was the 18th century. Let us only think in things that, that are universal, that are common to all humanity. Of course, in the 19th century, all those suppressed identities came roaring back, some in the form of the nation state, the new religion was nationalism, others in the form of race, the Aryan race, racism, Nazi, which became Nazism, and others again in terms of economic ideology, Marxism. So those were the bits of identity that came roaring back in the 19th century, and there were all three of them substitutes for religion. They turned out to be even bloodier than religion. Somehow the nationalism led to two world wars, uh, race led to the Holocaust, Marxist communism led to Stalin, the KGB and the Gulag. In all, a hundred million innocent lives murdered in the name of substitutes for religion. In the second half of the second, 20th century, people search for another alternative. Let's forget about the universal. Let's just abolish identity altogether and only talk about the individual. And the individual, as individual, is the hero of market economics and the liberal democratic state. Give me choices, that's the market. Give me the freedom to make those choices, that's the liberal democratic state. And for the rest, just leave me alone. It is the I, the iPhone, the iPad, the selfie, 
this is an age that abolished identity, not in the name of universalism, but in the name of individualism. And yet again, the tribes come roaring back, this time in the form of radical politicized Islam. Mm. Let's come back to the issue of religious texts. Yeah. Uh, you've written, um, never say I hate, I kill, because my religion says so. Every text needs interpretation. How did Judaism solve its own textual problems, and is this a guide for other religions to follow? No religion solves its textual, textual problems without being forced to do so by disaster. What happened basically was that Jews went through the kind of conflicts that Christianity went through in the 16th and 17th century, the kind of conflicts that Islam is going through now. It went through them in the first century, in the last years of the Second Temple when Judaism was so fissured and fragmented into Sadducees, Pharisees and Essenes, even the Pharisees themselves were divided into the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai and the rabbis said, you know, it was seemed as if the Torah had become two Torahs, there were two Judaisms even within that particular bit of the Jewish world. And then within the besieged Jerusalem there were the moderates who favoured accommodation with Rome, there were the zealots, and there were the ultra-zealots, who were probably the first recorded religious terrorists. They were called Sicarii. They went around stabbing people with daggers, not unlike the situation that's recently been developing in Israel itself. So we were there at the beginning of all this. The end result of this was a disaster of defeat by Rome, destruction of the temple seven, in the year 70, the last outpost of resistance, Masada, uh, the, the, the people surrounded there committing collective suicide rather than be taken captive by the Romans. People tried again in the days of Bar Kokhba 60 years later, which led to an even bigger disaster. And that became a self-inflicted tragedy from which it took Jews almost 2,000 years to recover. It is when you suffer self-inflicted tragedy that reasonable and reflective individuals sit back and say, this cannot be what God wants. And that is when you get people radically rereading texts. And the whole of rabbinic Judaism is a radical rereading of biblical texts. It's what we call midrash. And can you see such a circumstance developing in the next 5, 10, 15, 50 years for other religions? Well, Christianity, of course, went through this in the 17th century. And you had an extraordinary group of thinkers, um, John Milton, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, together with a uh, fairly radical Jew called Benedict Spinoza, Boris Spinoza, in Amsterdam, sitting and reading Tanakh, reading the Hebrew Bible, and coming up with the five ideas that made the modern world. Um, social contract, the moral limits of power, liberty of conscience, the doctrine of toleration, and human rights. All of those five concepts born in the 17th century through a radical, fresh look at the biblical texts. Even the atheist Thomas Paine writing Common Sense, the thing that is the tract that was supposed to have launched the American Revolution in 1776, begins by a long analysis of the Hebrew Bible. So Jews did it in the early rabbinical era, Christians did it in the 17th century, Muslims have already done it. They did it between the 8th and 12th centuries when the great scholars of Islam reclaimed the lost heritage of ancient Greece, which had been almost forgotten during the Dark Ages, and brought back Plato and Aristotle into circulation through these extraordinary thinkers, Averroes, Avicenna, Al-Farabi and others. And, of course, especially in Al-Andalus in Spain, developed what, for, by medieval standards, was a, a tolerant environment of coexistence. It was called convivencia, 
we see what impact it had on Judaism. Islam had a huge impact on Judaism. Moses Maimonides, in The Guide of the Perplexed, is in constant dialogue with the Mutta Kalimun, with the Kalam, the uh, Islamic philosophical tradition. Even his Mishneh Torah, his unsurpassed code of Jewish law, he says, he wrote because he saw that Jews lacked a code of law similar to the kind of code that Muslims had of Sharia. Even his formulation of the Animamin, you know, of the 13 principles of Jewish faith, came about because Muslims had a creed, Christians had a creed, Jews had no creed. So Moses Maimonides, the greatest rabbi of the Middle Ages, learnt a lot of what he did through Islamic inspiration. His son, Rabbi Avram, was particularly close to the Sufi mystical tradition within Islam. Islam gave Hebrew poets their first use of rhyme. You know, Hebrew poetry never rhymed before the ninth century. You know, biblical poetry is, is done by, by meter and parallelism, not by rhyme. That comes to Judaism from within in Islam. So, in, in a sense, Islam doesn't have to invent something it never encountered before. It merely has to recover its great tradition.